Women and Socialism by August Bebel, Chapter 8, Modern Marriage. 1. Marriage as a Profession. Marriage and the family are the foundations of the state. Whoever, therefore, attacks marriage and the family is attacking society and the state and undermining both. Thus exclaim the defenders of the present order. Monogamic marriage, as has been sufficiently shown, is the outcome of the system of gain and property that has been established by bourgeois society and therefore undoubtedly forms one of its basic principles. <clears throat> but whether it is adapted to natural needs and to a healthy development of human society is a different question. We will show that this marriage, which depends upon the bourgeois system of property, is a more or less forced relation. Having many disadvantages and frequently fulfilling its purpose only insufficiently or not at all. <clears throat> or not at all. We will, there, we will furthermore show that it is a social institution which is and remains inattainable to millions of persons, instead of being a free union founded on love, the only union suited to nature's purposes. <clears throat> John Stuart Mills says in regard to modern marriage, marriage is the only real bondage recognized by law. According to Kant's conception, man and women together constitute the perfect human being. Upon a normal union of the sexes, the healthy development of mankind depends. Satisfaction of the sexual impulse is essential to the sound physical and mental development of both man and woman. But man has gone beyond the animal stage, and so is not contented by the mere physical satisfaction of his sexual impulse. <clears throat> he requires intellectual attraction as well, and the existence of a certain harmony between himself and the person with whom he enters into union. Where such intellectual harmony fails to exist, the sexual intercourse is purely mechanical and thereby becomes immoral. Men and women of refinement demand a mutual attraction that extends beyond their sexual relations, and that shall have an, ennob an ennobling effect upon the new beings which may spring from their union. <clears throat> the fact that such a standard of ideals fails to exist in countless present-day marriages caused Varnhagen von Entz to write, Whatever we saw about us both of marriages already contracted and of marriages about to be contracted was not likely to implant in us a good opinion of such unions. On the contrary, the entire institution which is supposed to be founded on mutual love and respect and is instead founded on anything but that seemed coarse and despicable to us. And we fully agreed with Frederick Schlegel whose opinion on this subject we found expressed in the fragments of Antheneum, almost all marriages are concubinages. They are at best remote approaches to the true marriage, which should be a blending of two purses, persons into one. This is quite in keeping with the views of Kant. The joy in having progeny and the responsibility towards seem makes the relation <coughs> of love existing between two persons, one of longer duration. A couple desirous of entering marriage should therefore carefully consider whether their respective traits of character are suited to their union. The answer to this grave question ought to be unbiased, but that is only possible by the exclusion of every other interest that has no direct bearing on the purpose of the union satisfaction of the sexual impulse and propagation of one's own personality by means of propagation of the race, guided by a certain measure of insight that controls blind passion. As these conditions fail to be observed in a tremendous number of cases in present-day society, it is evident that modern marriage frequently fails to fulfill its true object and that we are not justified in regarding it as an ideal institution. How many marriages are contracted on an entirely different basis than the one described above cannot be demonstrated. <clears throat> the parties concerned like to have their marriage appear different from what it really is. Here, a condition of hypocrisy presents itself, such as no previous social period has known in a similar degree. The state, the political representative of society, has no inclination to institute investigations that would cast an unfavorable light upon society. 
The state itself marries its officials and servants according to maxims that cannot be measured by the standard that should constitute the foundation of true marriage. 2. Decline of the birth rate. Marriage, in order to realize the purpose of nature, should be a union founded on mutual love. But this motive is rarely met with, unalloyed under present conditions. To the great majority of women, marriage is a means of livelihood that they must obtain at any cost. On the other hand, a great many men regard marriage from a purely commercial point of view, weighing and considering its material advantages and disadvantages. Even those marriages that are not based on selfish, sordid motives are frequently marred and broken up by the harsh realities of life. Only rarely those hopes are realized that were held by a man and woman prior to their marriage. That is only natural, for in order to lead a contented marriage life, married, married life, not only mutual love and respect are required, but economic security as well. That is a certain measure of the necessities and comforts of life in order to satisfy the needs of man and wife and their children. Material cares and the cruel struggle for existence are destructive to marital contentment and happiness. But these material cares increase with the increasing number of offspring. In other words, the better marriage fulfills its natural object, the greater become these cares. The peasant, for instance, takes pleasure in every new calf that has that his cow brings forth. He cheerfully counts his sticking pigs or stickling pigs and relates the good news of their arrival to his neighbors. But he looks somber when a new baby is added to the number of children that, that he feels able to support without care, not a large number forsooth, and he looks doubly somber if the newly born babe has the ill fortune of being a girl. <clears throat> we may say then that both marriages and births are controlled by economic conditions. This is especially evident in France, where agriculture is carried on by a division of the land into small lots, the products of which are not sufficient to support a large family. The famous or notorious French system of having no more than two children, a system that has developed into a social institution in France, is the result. In many provinces, the population is accordingly almost stationary, while in others, there has been a marked decline. The same results that the methods of farming have produced in the rural districts have been produced in the cities by industry. In fact, the birth rate is declining even more rapidly in the cities. The number of births is constantly decreasing in France, in spite of the fact that the number of marriages is increasing. This is true not only of France, but of the majority of civilized countries. This fact points to a development produced by our social conditions that should make the ruling classes think. <clears throat> in 1881, 937,057 children were born in France. In 1906, 806,847. And in 1907, only 773,969. In 1907, 163,088 fewer children were born than in 1881. It is a noteworthy fact that the number of illegitimate births did not decrease. There were 70,079 of these in 1881. During the period from 1881 to 1890, they attained their highest figure, 75,754, and in 1906, there still were 70,866. The decline of the birth rate then was confined entirely to the legitimate births. <clears throat> During the entire century, a decline of the birth rate was noticeable. <clears throat> it is natural that this symptom is a cause of much concern to French statesmen and economists, but the problem is not confined to France. Since a long time, the same phenomenon may be observed in Germany, especially in Saxony, the decline of the birth rate has been even more rapid. <clears throat> the majority of the other European countries present a similar condition. The decline of the birth rate then is a general one, and though France and Ireland show the lowest figures, the decline is most rapid in England, Germany, and Scotland. We meet with the same phenomenon in the United States and Australia. <clears throat> 
In many respects, our views differ from differ but slightly from those of barbarian people. Among the latter, newly born children were often killed. This fate especially befell the girls. Among some living savages, the same custom still prevails. We do not kill the girls. We are too civilized for that, but frequently we treat them as pariahs. Men being the stronger everywhere represses woman in the struggle for existence, and if she still persists in the struggle, she is often persecuted by the stronger sex as an undesirable competitor. <clears throat> Men of the upper classes are especially bitter against female competition. Among working men, the demand to exclude women from the trades is voiced only rarely. When a resolution formulating such a dem uh, demand was presented at a Congress of French Workingmen in 1876, it was voted down by a large majority. Since that time, the conviction that the working woman is a fellow being entitled to equal rights and privileges has grown among the class-conscious working men of all countries. The resolutions passed by international working men's congresses prove this. The class-conscious working men knows that present industrial conditions compel woman to enter into competition with man. He also knows that an attempt to exclude woman from industry would be as futile as an attempt to forbid the use of machinery. Therefore, he endeavors to instruct woman in regard to her position in society and to enlist her aid in the struggle for freedom of the proletariat against capitalism. Three mercenary marriage and the matrimonial market. Modern society has undoubtedly advanced beyond any previous stage of development, but our conceptions concerning the relation of the sexes has in many respects remained unchanged. In 1876, Professor L. V. Stein published a book on woman in the field of political economy that is not suited to its title since it merely draws a very poetically tinted picture of marriage. But this picture clearly shows the submissive position of woman in her relation to the lion, man. Stein writes, Man desires a being who not only loves him, but also understands him. He seeks one who is not only devoted to him, but whose soft hand smooths the wrinkles on his forehead, who brings into his life peace, calm, order, gentle self-control, and all the many little comforts of life to which he returns daily. <clears throat> he needs someone to enhance all these things with the inexpressible charm of womanliness, imparting warmth and joy to his home. Beneath this apparent praise of woman lurks her degradation and the egotism of man. The professor depicts woman as a dainty creature, endowed nevertheless with the needless knowledge of, of arithmet arithmetic to keep the household accounts well balanced. Caressing like a gentle spring breeze, the master of the house, the ruling lion, and with her soft hands smoothing the wrinkles from his forehead that perhaps have appeared there from brooding over his own stupidity. The professor depicts woman and marriage such as barely one among a hundred actually exist. About the many thousand unhappy marriages, about the great number of women to whom it is never given to attain marriage, and about the millions of women who must slave besides, beside their husbands from morning till night to earn their daily bread, he seems to see and know nothing whatever. All these marriages are stripped of poetry by the harsh reality of life, more quickly than a careless hand strips the colored dust from a butterfly's wing. One glance at those countless women sufferers would have greatly marred the professor's poetically tinted picture. The women he observes only constitute a small minority, and it is doubtful whether they represent an advanced type. There is a frequently quoted saying that the degree of civilization attained by a nation may be measured by the position of its women. We uphold the justice of this saying, but upon applying this standard, we find that our highly lauded civilization does not amount to much. In his book on the subjection of women, the title shows the conception of the position of woman held by the author. John Stuart Mills says, Men have become more domesticated. Increasing civilization has put more fetters on man in regard to women. That is true to some extent wherever an honest marriage relation exists between husband and wife. 
but to a considerably large minority, it does not apply. Intelligent men will recognize that it is to their own advantage if women are drawn out into the world from their narrow domestic sphere and are given an opportunity to become acquainted with the great problems of the day. The fetters that are thereby placed on him are not hard to bear. On the other hand, the question arises whether modern life has not brought new factors into the matrimonial relation that are more apt to destroy marriage than any previously known. Marriage has become an object of material calculation in a marked degree. The man who wishes to marry and seeking to obtain a wife also seeks to obtain property. That was the chief reason why daughters, who were at first excluded from the right of inheritance when the patriarchal system came into power, were at an early period reinstated to this right. But never before was the marriage market as openly and cynically displayed as today. Never before was marriage regarded in the same degree as a simple speculation, a mere financial transaction. At present, matchmaking is frequently carried on so shamelessly that the off that the often repeated phrase about the sanctity of marriage becomes a farce. Still, for this fact, as for all others, an explanation can be found. At no previous time was it so difficult for the great majority of people to accumulate a modest fortune as it is at present, and at no previous time was the striving for a decent livelihood and the enjoyment of life so general. Those who do not attain the aim they have set for themselves feel their disappointment all the more keenly because all believe to have the same right to enjoyment. No formal difference of class or caste exists. Everyone hopes to attain some aim that seems attainable in accordance with his station in life. But many are called and few are chosen. In order that one may live in comfort, 20 others must live in want. And in order that one may revel in luxury, hundreds or thousands must dwell in poverty. But everyone is eager to be one of the favored few and accordingly resorts to all means that are likely to lead him to his goal. One of the simplest and most accessible means of attaining a privileged social position is a mercenary marriage. In this way, the desire for money on the one side and the desire for social rank and title on the other obtain mutual satisfaction among the upper classes of society. Here, marriage is degraded to a business transaction. It becomes a, con a conventional union that both sides respect outwardly, while secretly both all too often follow their own inclinations. In every large city, there are certain places where, upon definite days, members of the upper classes come together, chiefly for the purpose of matchmaking. Rightly having these reunions, rightly have these reunions been called the matrimonial market, for just as on the stock market, speculation and barter dominate, and not infrequently fraud and deception enter into the dealings. Here we find officers of the army, over head and ears in debt, but possessing some ancient title of nobility, Rue, weakened by a life of debauchery who seek a wife to nurse them and hope to mend their shattered health in marriage. Manufacturers, merchants, and bankers, who are at the verge of bankruptcy, sometimes at the verge of imprisonment, and who wish to be saved, and public officials who have prospects of promotion, but are in need of money. Here they come as customers and conclude the marriage bargain. In these marriages, it frequently is deemed quite immaterial whether the future wife is young or old, pretty or ugly, well-built or deformed, educated or ignorant, pious or frivolous, a Christian or a Jewess, provided that she, that she has money. Money redeems all faults and compensates for the lack of anything else. According to the German law, procurers are severely punished by imprisonment, but when parents or guardians barter their children or relatives to some unloved man or woman for life, for the sake of wealth, social position, or some other advantage, no public prosecutor may interfere, and yet a crime has been committed. There are many well-organized matrimonial agencies, and any number of procurers and procuresses who are searching candidates for the sacred wedded state. 
These transactions are especially profitable when performed in the interest of members of the upper classes. In 1878, a procuress was tried in Vienna who had been accused of being an accomplice in murder and was finally sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. Among other things, the trial revealed that the former French ambassador to Vienna, Count Beneville, had paid this woman 22,000 guilders for procuring a wife for him. Other members of the aristocracy were also involved in this trial. For years, the authorities had permitted this woman to ply her criminal trade unmolested. In the capital of the German Empire, similar occurrences were reported. They are met with wherever there are persons seeking to contract mercenary marriages. During the last few decades, the daughters and heiresses of American millionaires have become special objects of desire to the pauperized European nobility. These American women, on the other hand, have exchanged their millions for the rank and title that are unknown in their own country. A number of communications published in the German press during the fall of 1889 contained some characteristic information on this subject. According to this, a German nobleman living in California had offered his services as a matchmaker by advertising in German and Austrian papers. The offers he received in return clearly show the conceptions prevailing in the circles concerned in regard to the sanctity of marriage and its ethical side. Two Prussian army officers, members of an ancient nobility, sought his services and frankly stated as the reason of their doing so, the fact that together they owed over $15,000. In their letter to the procurer, they literally wrote, it is self understood that we cannot pay anything in advance. You will receive your remuneration immediately after the wedding journey. Only recommend ladies to us whose families are in no wise objectionable. We would also consider it very desirable to meet ladies who are particularly good looking. If required, we will give your agent our photographs who can also give us further details, show us the ladies photographs, etc. We regard this whole transaction as an affair of honor and expect the same of you. We expect an early reply through your agent on this side. A young German nobleman, Hans V. H., wrote from London that he were five foot ten of ancient nobility and employed in diplomatic service. He confessed that his fortune had been greatly diminished by unsuccessful betting at the races, and that he was therefore and and that he was therefore compelled to seek a rich wife. I am prepared, he wrote, to come to the United States immediately. The German-American nobleman asserted that besides a number of counts, barons, etc., he had counted among his customers three princes and 16 dukes. Some men who were not the proud possessors of a title bargained for American heiresses likewise. An architect, Max W. from Leipzig, asked for a fiancé who must be rich, beautiful, and cultured. A young manufacturer, Robert D. from Kale on the, on the Rhine, wrote that he would content himself with a fiancé owning $100,000 and promised in advance that he would make her happy. But we, we, need not, we need not look far to find further instances of this sort. We need but glance at the matrimonial advertisements in many of our capitalistic papers to recognize them as the outward signs of degrading views. The prostitute who plies her trade as a result of bitter need is morally superior to these marriage seekers. The editor of a socialist paper who should venture to publish such adver advertisements would be expelled from his party. The capitalistic press does not hesitate to publish such advertisements because they pay. But that does not prevent this same press from railing against the socialistic principles as being destructive of marriage. No age has been more hypocritical than ours. Most of these newspapers are nothing more or less than matrimonial agencies. One might fill entire pages with, with clippings taken from leading newspapers on a single day. Sometimes the interesting fact is revealed. 
that even ministers are sought in this way and that ministers also resort to this method to seek wives. Sometimes the applicants even consent to overlook a moral blemish, provided that the girl is rich. The moral degradation of certain strata of society could not be more vividly exposed than by this sort of marriage.